In the military, you're given a uniform and instructed on how to do things and when to do them. But what happens when the cadence fades and you're no longer wearing that uniform? I'm Papa Kilo, and I started this podcast to fill that silence with direction and to provide overall support for my beloved military family. Welcome to the Morning Formation. Welcome to the Morning Formation. Again, our guest today is going to be retired First Sergeant Samuel Phillips, my father. He's an Army veteran, having served 20 years after being drafted at the end of, at the end of Vietnam in 1971. So last episode, he shared with us his experiences from his time as a drill sergeant. And then we stopped at the point of when he was beginning his time after his drill sergeant uh, stint. First Sergeant, thank you so much for joining us today. Good afternoon. So when we last spoke, you were finishing up your second stint as a drill sergeant, but let's go back and so we can chronologically talk about this. So you did three years, you did your three years of your drill sergeant time at Fort Knox. And at that point you were in E6, right? Yes. Six at the end. Yes. And then you got stationed in Schofield Barracks in Hawaii, right? Yes, I did. 25th division combat support company Ford. 4.2 inch mortar platoon uh, in first of the 27th infantry wolfhounds. And that's where I spent that entire two years, two deployments to Korea during that two years from Hawaii to Korea. First deployment was a month long and the second deployment, I stayed there for about two months. Had several trips over to the big island, the Hakaloa training area. After two years, I got just had the urge to go back on drill sergeant duty again. So I filled out the paperwork and uh, sent it in and got approved for to leave after two years, to leave the 25th division and go back on drill sergeant status again. And again, I was sent back to Fort Knox, Kentucky, where I spent the next two years as a drill sergeant there. And then from there, you transitioned after your two years, you transitioned into the regular army. So you talk about where you where was your next stop after that? After my two years on drill status, second time I went, um, I got orders first. That, that was pretty, pretty lucky on my part. I, I got orders to go to 10th Mountain Division in Fort Drum, New York. And man, I, I did not want to go to New York. I just, that was, I didn't even want to think about it. So anyway, I got on the phone right away and called uh, the assignments branch at Department of the Army in Washington. And, and uh, I just expressed my desire not to go to New York. Got anything, anywhere. I'll take anything, anywhere, not New York. And after talking to the guy on the phone, I found out that the, the, the sergeant in charge of the assignments, me and him had gone to the advanced course at Fort Benning, Georgia together. We both live in Charlie. And he found out that I had done real well on my last two uh, SQT or school, skill qualification tests. And he said, oh, man, said, I'm lucky today because I found you. And he said, we need somebody that's real efficient in 11 Charlie procedures to go to Florida and work with the Florida National Guard. I said, that's exactly what I wanted. Anyway, I was, he revoked those orders just a few days later. I got orders revoking New York and reassignment orders assigning me to Fort Gillum, Georgia with duty at Patrick Air Force Base in Florida, and that's uh, at Cocoa Beach. Mm -hmm. So you went from the Mountain Division down to the Beach Division. Yes, I did. <laughs> wow, you so lucky. I was on a in a group there called the Infantry Team. It was a we had about 40, 40 soldiers all together, roughly, in the readiness group, and uh, there was five infantry, two special forces. Uh, I know there was some artillery and some armor. All the major MOSs had somebody there to go out to the to the Florida National Guard and assist them in their training. And there was, uh, in my infantry team, we had uh, two E-7s, E-8, a captain, and a lieutenant colonel. The commander of that readiness group was a full bird colonel who had just got reassigned, like I did, from a unit. He was uh, a brigade, Colonel Dickinson. He was a brigade commander prior to getting to Florida, the brigade commander at the 82nd Airborne, he said that his requirement was that we travel to National Guard units and work with the National Guard 
180 days a year. And he said, then when I get my report in and I see that you traveled 180 days, he'll say, he said, then I will know that you did the minimum that you could to get by. He said, so I would suggest you travel more than that. So we, probably around 200 to 220 days a year, we were traveling to National Guard unit. Most of them were overnight because you had to, most of the trips we went on were by car. We had government vehicles. We did have one plane when we'd go to Miami sometime, we'd fly. When we'd go to Tallahassee sometime, we'd fly. But um, we, had, we had infantry units that I dealt with personally all the way from down in Homestead, Florida. We had an infantry unit all the way up into the Panhandle in North Florida and then from east to west coast mm -hmm. in the middle of Florida and all over. So I got to see just about all of Florida that there was to see. And it was really impressive that the Florida National Guard the infantry side of it, at least, was very, very efficient in their duties. They really impressed me. And then every year, of course, when the National Guard would have their two week summer camp, the infantry would go to Camp Blanding, Florida, which was up in kind of north. Uh, close, not too far from Tallahassee. And that's where they would do the two weeks training and we'd have to go with them every year and stay with them for two weeks. And it was an interesting job. I, I, I liked that job mm -hmm. quite a bit. And I'd have to take uh, TDY trips to Fort Benning occasionally to make sure that I was up to speed on all the current things that I was telling the National Guard. And if there's anything changed, I'd have to mm -hmm. come back and relay that onto the National Guard units. So you were almost like the NCOIC for the entire Florida National Guard training section. Kind of. Any questions they had, uh, they looked at their readiness group for help. And anything that they didn't understand, they knew they could call a readiness group and somebody there was going to come down and sit down with them and explain and talk or teach classes. I've taught FDC classes. What's FC, FDC? stand for fire direction center for mortars i taught that uh, yeah we'd teach you classes because they just weren't i guess good enough to teach and they were but they i think they just kind of felt better when we'd do it plus we had to do something anyway mm -hmm. so we enjoyed going down i did i enjoyed going out to the units and teaching uh, any kind of class uh, followed the, the Florida, one of the Florida units went to uh, Fort Rucker, Alabama uh, to do a live fire with mortars. And they called me and said, we're going up there. We'd like to have you around to watch us and see if we're doing everything the way we're supposed to. So I'd follow them to Fort Rucker and stay with them while they're doing their live fire. And so I can totally understand why. I mean, if you're going to be instructing, you need to rehearse. And you need to, and if you're doing it, you know, as National Guard one week in a month, you you don't have that time to actually, you know, sit down and 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 rehearse and and you know the instruction that you're going to put out. So I could see why they would want someone that's full time that this is your 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 day and night basically that you're going to be instructing and knowing every the in, ins and outs of everything. So that makes a lot of sense actually. Yeah, so I enjoyed that. I heard you mention in one of the earlier podcast about it's a small world mm -hmm. i was out there at camp blanding at summer camp one day walking through a big pine thicket and i heard somebody say joe phillips and i turned around and looked and saw the name tag and still wasn't sure who it was but i, I recognized that name tag but it was a a guy that i grew up with he lived from my my home that I grew up in in Clearfield, Kentucky. He probably lived 300 meters away from where I did. And I hadn't seen him since he was just a little tiny boy, but he, he knew me, knew my face enough to call my name, see if I stopped. I've seen him once after we both retired. I seen him once. Yeah. He was part of the Florida national guard at the time. No, he was, uh, what was he doing? He was, he was active duty army. 
Yeah, he was active duty Army, and he was sent down there to summer camp to evaluate the training that they was doing. I don't know where he was. I don't, I don't remember us talking about that. I don't know where he was actually stationed, but he was TDY to evaluate their training. See, that's what these other people do. They would evaluate, and then if they did bad, they wouldn't tell them how to fix it. They would just write, oh, these people really suck at what they're doing. Our job was to go out, and if we seen them doing something wrong, right we wouldn't tell them they suck at what they're doing we'd tell them what they're doing wrong and this is what you need to do fix it so they right we were the good guy Mm -hmm. that's kind of good to hear that you had a good working relationship with the national guard because i know a lot of times the reserves national guard and active duty military um sometimes there's um i don't want to say friction but there's a lot of stereotypes a lot of things in there that basically that people think about each component but it's, it's refreshing to hear that you guys had a really good relationship with them, like training wise. You finished up your time working as, as the state training, one of the straight state training NCOs for the Florida National Guard on the active duty component side. Where, what was your next move? Next move was when I, I called DA again, Department of Army, the assignments branch, and asked them what they had available. That was time for me to leave coming up pretty soon told him I expressed my desire that I'd like to go back to the 25th Infantry Division in Hawaii. And uh, they told me, they said, well, we, we're recruiting Ranger qualified people right now to go over there and set up a school's command, set up a cl- uh, school. So that's where I got orders to go back to Hawaii where I was assigned to a school's command. They were setting up a, a school there called a light fighter program. And at that time, the 25th Division was transitioning from a regular infantry unit to a light infantry unit. And they had to go through some training, uh, more like a mini ranger training, I'll say, I guess, as a rites of passage to become light infantry. Every soldier, including the post commander, the general himself, had to go through that light fighters course. And it was a week long. They'd bring out a battalion at a time. And we'd run them through the light fighter course. They would go back and then the next week we'd get another battalion. And that was the main reason that I got to go back to the to Hawaii was because we were still writing lesson plans and getting stuff ready to get that class off the ground and functioning. They're in that school's command at East Range, Hawaii. Uh, there was uh, the light fighters course. Mm-hmm. There was uh, air assault school, the ranger indoctrination program for 25th division and a repel master course. And that's what we were training. All of those, all of those fit in the school's command. Uh, at first I was just uh, working in the light fighter part of the program. And for about the first year that I was there, I was an instructor on the repel tower. And uh, then we kind of, after we got most of the 25th division ran through the light fighters course, we kind of consolidated and we were all, all those other classes, schools that I mentioned were kind of come together as one. So, Mm -hmm. oh, and while I was there, they made the, oh, what was that movie they made? Oh, you mean you're talking about the, uh, the episodes. It wasn't a movie, right? It was a series. No, yeah, it was a series. Tour of duty. Tour of duty. Yeah, they made tour of duty while I was there. We got to look out the windows of our little shack and watch a lot of different scenes being shot out there. But that was a real, real, that was probably one of the best assignments that I had that I enjoyed as much or more than any of the rest of them. I really, really liked the people. They were all ranger qualified. They were all professional. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had zero trouble or incidents of anything. We done a lot I know of- before, I'm sorry, I know before talking to you, you mentioned that one of the things that you liked about it was the fact that it was just kind of far away from the flagpole. You guys were just out in the middle of the woods. I mean, for people that haven't been to East Range, I don't even know if it's open today. I think they still use it as a training area, but I was part of the last, uh, well, I was in the last air assault class in 2000, was it 2006? No, 2005. In December of 2005, after I got back from deployment, I was in the very last uh, air assault course. And we're talking about a small army. The commandant of that air assault course was Sergeant Major Ordonio. Awesome guy. 
who was an E5 that worked for me as an E5. I was E7, he was an E5. He was one of the guys that looked me up and down and was like, what the hell happened to you? Like, cause, cause uh, you were an NCO, you, you were tabbed out and, and, you know, done your drill sergeant time. And here I was just a, I think at the time I was a first lieutenant um, and I had nothing on my chest. So the air assault badge was going to be the first thing that I put on there. But anyways, um, yeah, small army uh, because I had mentioned, uh, I think you reached out to him and told him that I was stationed there. Yeah, I right? did. And then I called him. Yeah. And then I was able to get into the last air assault, the last air assault school. So very fortunate with that. But for people that haven't been to East Range before, I mean, it's literally out in the middle of the woods, right? Located in Wahiwa. Oh, yeah. It's up on the it's up in the mountains behind Wahiwa. Uh, yeah, it was there was sometimes weeks go by before I'd ever go to Schofield Barracks. I'd leave home. I'd go straight to East Range and it was all dirt roads up through there and yeah. had a, a big fence around it and pretty pretty excellent and we had little camouflage wooden shacks out there and that was our offices and we had a lieutenant colonel who was actually in charge of all of it and a sergeant major and then myself and jimmy acuna we made e8 and we were in cois together of the entire schools command then i mean we we, we watched over the air assault and the rip and yeah repel masters and and all of them and then after we both made E8, it was inevitable that we move on down the line and try to get a diamond put in our in our stripes. And we went, went out searching for uh, first sergeant positions. Mm -hmm. I found one. I was in a, not in an infantry unit. I found one in the 25th S&T Supply and Transportation Battalion. And I was relieving or taking the place of a first sergeant that was moving on. He was rotating out of Hawaii. I got to talk to this uh, E-8. Come to find out this E-8 was Frank D. Miller. You can Google his name and find him on the internet. He was a Medal of Honor recipient. So a lot of people say Medal of Honor winners. Uh, you don't win the Medal of Honor. You, you earn it, you receive it because you earn it. Frank Miller was a, mm -hmm. an exceptionally different kind of person uh he was since a hero and yet he was he was just sort of i don't want to say laid back but he was just calm nothing mm -hmm. upset frank miller and he was truly concerned about um, how i was going to treat the soldiers his soldiers after he left you know he made it clear they were all good people and i didn't need to go in there and start trying to hang a bunch of them and Frank sat down one day, just me and him, one on one, and he told me the story, the incidents around him receiving that Medal of Honor. That is a t that is a story or a time that I wish I'd have had more time with him because as he told that story, he was he must, you could tell he obviously told that story many many times to other people. Frank would tell you that story, and it was like watching the best movie that you've ever seen in your life. And you get focused on it and you, you just lose the rest of the world around you. Sitting there listening to Frank tell that story was, uh, I just didn't want it to end. He, he told that story that well, but uh, it was a, it was a real honor to have been able to step in the footprints where Frank had, had been the first sergeant. I had a lot to learn in that company. You know, I, th I thought, well, this S&T battalion, supply and transportation, after being in infantry for 18 years, this is going to be a walk in the park. But I got in there with a whole bunch of different MOSs that uh, I knew nothing about. So I had a lot of learning to do. And, you know, I used to, I had cooks in my company. And, I, of course, when you're in the infantry, you think cooks are just – they're they're nothing to you, but you learn to respect everybody that's got a job because they're all equally important. Without the cooks, we couldn't eat. If we didn't eat, we couldn't be an infantryman. So I was, uh, I had a lot to learn. I did learn a lot and mm -hmm. I was highly impressed with the professionalism. And I tried to, about the only thing I could do because I was not proficient in their MOSs. Only thing I could do was uh, take them out and try to PT them to death. 
And at first, <laughs> they weren't in real good physical shape because that's one thing. And I have to say, Frank mm -hmm. did not do a lot of PT because he, he just wasn't able. You know, he's shot up too bad. So he had to turn his PT over to NCOs and his company. At first, they were, they were pretty weak. But when I left there, I had probably the best physically fit <laughs> uh, supply and transportation people in the 25th Division. So hang on a second. I want to explain to people how insanely good you are with running and PT and those things of that nature. So just give me an idea. Your, your, uh, what, what was your run like? Like what, what was your time back then? Average. Uh, back then when I was in the S and T battalion. Yeah. Let's just say any, any time around there. Cause I know you, you were probably pretty consistent with your, with your PT, with your, with your PT test. Yeah. I ran, I, when I, when I was 40 years old, I was running two mile PT test in uh, about 11, 11 and a half minutes. Now, let's not even mention the fact that you smoked cigarettes for 20 years. Yeah, I, I smoked cigarettes the entire time I was in the surf, almost, except for the last year. So you ran 11 minute, two mile runs, and I'm sure that that wasn't even really nothing to you, right? And then you would smoke a cigarette afterwards. Yes. <laughs> That's insane. And... And I trained, I trained that S and T battalion. I had a whole bunch of them that wanted to run the Honolulu marathon. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'm too old to run 26 miles, but if you want to, I'll try to train you. So I would take the ones that wanted to run in the marathon. Yeah. I'd take them out every morning and we'd run at least 10 miles. And oh. I was, I was always the first one back to the company. Mm -hmm. You know, we've stayed close together, but I was always in front. Nobody could keep up. Nobody could pass me up and beat me back to the company. You know what? Honestly, I think when I was in the army, that was the one thing that I always tried to do was to try to stay in front of everyone else. Like whenever it came to PT and things like that, that's just what you're supposed to do as a leader. You're supposed to, you know, charge ahead and try to be competitive and try to push everyone else to do their best. So, yeah, I, that's uh, I had to take it. I had to take a quick break on that and, and emphasize your physicality and your physical fitness uh because i know that when i found out what your times were your two mile times i was like there's no way in hell i'm gonna get 11 minute 11 minute two mile <laughs> ever in my life i'm not a runner like that my commander company commander is a captain heinrich and he was a marathon he was a triathlon oh, runner yeah. he run mm -hmm. several triathlons and he could run the two miles faster than i could but uh, when we do PT, I developed a thing for the S&T battalion, and I called it the ditch line PT. And, you know, in Hawaii, especially up there, Schofield Barracks in the mountains, it rained quite a few days sometimes. And we had PT, and ditch lines would get full of water, and it would get muddy, and we'd go out and do what I call ditch line PT. We'd run, then we'd just stop running, jump in a ditch full of water and do push-ups and sit-ups and just slop around like hogs. And man, they, them, them kids, they love that. They'd always ask, first sergeant, we do ditch line PT today. It's raining. It's nasty out here. Sometimes that was the, that was the thing was to just prove how, how much nastier and how much dirtier you could get and how, how deep you could dig, you know, whenever it sucked. It was just the best thing to do was just to do your best to enjoy it and laugh and and just suck it up basically and just deal with it you know you're gonna get dirty today you're gonna get nasty today you're gonna sway today you're gonna work your ass off today and i think a lot of people feel a sense of accomplishment when it's all said and done yeah captain heinrich i remember when he left just a few months before i did uh, and i can remember in his changing command ceremony he got up there and at the podium told the whole crowd he said uh, i was real fortunate to get first sergeant phillips he said i'd never in my life would have thought that i could get a 40 year old man that could hurt me in pt but he said i hurt places and i've been sore in places since he got there that i never had before but yeah no i, I remember a lot of these guys that you're talking about um how, how impressive they are like they're, as far as the physical fitness and just overall leadership where did you go to after you were the first sergeant of that unit or was there anything else that you want to summarize to finish off that position and that that time no well just after that uh, after i finished my tour in hawaii and got my diamond that's what i was looking for i uh, was uh, 
assigned for my last duty station was at uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. I got there, and again, instead of being put in a regular T&E unit, I was assigned to as assistant commandant of the 1st Infantry Division NCO Academy. And that's where I spent my last two years in Fort Riley, Kansas. With the big red one. Big red one, yeah. Hawaii to Fort Riley. And, uh, you know, being with the NCO Academy, again, it was a, an area that was not up on main post. It was kind of just inside the gate, not too far. And there was nothing else around. It was in the old World War II wooden barracks building. And I hardly ever got up to the main post for any reason. And uh, again, I've spent my last two years in a training capacity. A lot of a lot of good good NCOs there too. They were professionals, been teaching classes there for quite a while, and they were all real strack, spit shine boots, starch fatigue, and you know, they they were a good good bunch of NCOs. Mm -hmm. Made my last tour very easy. So I know around, right around this time was around the time that they started the uh, Desert Storm, right? Actually, I retired in January 91. So it was January of 90. I applied for my retirement. You could, you could apply for your retirement one year in advance. And it was almost not more than 11 months out from my retirement. Mm -hmm. I'd already put in for retirement. And once you put in for it, there's no going back. You can't, uh, you can't say, oh, I changed my mind. I want to stay in. You're, mm -hmm. You put in for your retirement, it's approved, and you, uh, you're going to retire. Right. It's that simple. It was toward the end, I guess, of 1990 that they started having the conflicts in, with Iraq, and I'd already put in for retirement, so they didn't. If I hadn't put in for it when I did, or close to when I did, I would have probably got uh, held over, held back, and not not allowed to retire until after Desert Storm was over. Yeah. So how that would work is you would get a warning order, right, and that would pretty much you would be stop loss. Yeah. Yeah. Just be just stop. But uh, I'd already put in for it, so it wasn't even mentioned. My retirement went right on just like it was just timing, just like it would have, right? If nothing was happening. Finished up your twenty. 20 year career as a uh, as a first sergeant at the NCO Academy in Fort Riley. Yes, sir. And it was about one year prior to me getting out. It was on in July of 1990, I guess. Someone had bought me some chewing gum to help me stop smoking. That uh, inspired me to throw the cigarettes away, and mm -hmm. I haven't had one since. I just wish I'd have done it. 20 years earlier, 30 years or So just real quick, what were your thoughts about retiring and Desert Storm? And, you know, how, how did you see, do you kind of wish that you had actually gone to Desert Storm or is it something that, that you don't really feel like impacted a whole lot? I mean, what, like, cause I know you have friends that actually, that actually went, one of your good buddies uh, went to Desert Storm. And I mean, was, was it kind of hard after 20 years after serving and getting all that training and stuff to, to just have timing basically well when i mm -hmm. going back 20 years i when i went in when i got drafted i i thought my thought then was i'm going to do as much as i can possibly do in two years and then i'm going to get out i wanted to go to vietnam i wanted to go to vietnam real bad i asked to go a couple of different times and it didn't turn out that way as far as desert storm i think I didn't want to go to Desert Storm as bad as I did Vietnam because I was planning on getting out. And if they had a stop to me, it would probably not, I probably wouldn't have enjoyed it that much. But if I'd have been planning on going on and making a career, longer career out of it, then I think that uh, right. I would have wanted the same thing, way that I did going to Vietnam. I'd have wanted to go to Desert Storm too. I completely understand because when I was in, actually, they were doing a lot of stop loss. And uh, I know people personally who who had plans to get out like they had family plans. They had plans to get out and get a job here, do this, move here or whatever. And it wasn't fair because they would do their time. They would do their deployment and then they would come back. And just by circumstance where they were at and the timing and where they were, what 
what they were assigned to, mm -hmm. they would get stop lost. And then, so basically that just meant, Hey, you can't go anywhere. You can't retire. You can't, can't uh, ETS can't get out. You got to go deploy again for another year. So that's a different, different version of the draft. It is one of my old first sergeants actually that happened to him. He came back from Iraq and then for some reason he had to go to a different company and the new company he was going to, he, he goes there and he starts, you know, doing his first sergeant thing. And then next thing you know, they get a warning order. So within, I think, let's say eight months of him coming back from deployment, he had to go back to Iraq again. And this time he went as a, first, he, this time he went as a first sergeant. So he was a master sergeant with us, promoted, you know, E8, or I'm sorry, he was E7 with us, promoted as an E8. Then he uh, went over to another company, got a warning order. And then next thing you know, he, he had to go back into Iraq in like eight months. And it's, it sucks, man, because it's just like, you're, you know, you got family, you, you're at a different place in life. Um, that That's kind of how it was for me when I got out too. I got out in 2007 and when I got out, I made sure that I, that I was going to have no IRR time or no reserve time because I just, I wanted to get out. Like I didn't want to have this, this string still attached to me where at any point in time they could be like, Hey, come back. So they counted my enlisted time while I was in the national guard, um, as well as my active duty officer time. So it was a total of eight years. So I got, my, I got lucky with that. They initially tried to give me the IRR time, but I found the regulations that showed otherwise. So it was kind of on me. But at any rate, I just want to summarize everything we've been talking for about 40 minutes again. There's so many things that you run across in 20 years that you can't, it's impossible to, to cover them all. But when I look back on it myself, it, it was the best 20 years of my life. I'm, I'm, I don't regret a day of it. If, it was, if I had it all to do over, I'd do it about the same way. You know, and when you joined, how old were you? I was 20 years old. And so you weren't even old enough to drink yet. And that's why I say a lot of times when I talk to young people about, you know, joining the military and, and, the, you know, I'm not sure, I don't know if that's what I want to do or whatever. And understand that when you're, when you're that young, a lot of times you don't know what's best for you. Like if you give someone their, their druthers or what they want to do, they want to sit on the couch all day and play video games. Like they want to stay within their comfort zone. They want to stay within their own community, within their own friends, within their own clique, you know, but when you join the military, you get shipped out to basic or boot camp, whatever you go to, and you're forced to get along with people from all over the United States. And you're forced to get out of your comfort zone. You're forced to make decisions. You're, you're forced to make decisions and screw up or succeed. And that's something that you can't do sitting at home on your couch. So, you know, you, you turned a, uh, a dreadful draft letter into a illustrious career of accomplishing a lot. And I think that's what people need to understand about the military is, it is what you make of it. It's an opportunity. Absolutely is. So I mentioned, I mentioned to you before about that, about, you know, if, if you ever th often think about like what you would be doing, and I guess it's just kind of hard to imagine what you'd be doing if you'd never gotten that draft letter. I don't have any idea, but I guarantee you it wouldn't have been anything nearly as good as getting drafted. Right. Okay. My life would have been so much different, probably not nearly as good. Yeah. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you for giving us your time. And, um, you know, you, you've been three podcast episodes, about 40 minutes each. You've given us a 20 year span of your awesome military career. You did a lot of things and had a lot of, um, had a lot of folks that you came in contact with and you changed their lives. And that's, that's amazing in itself. And I know I, that's kind of one of my goals with this podcast is to reach out to people and to, you know, talk about these types of stories or whatever and people who are on the fence about joining the military you know listen to these stories and listen to how things turned out for folks and you decide for yourself but be informed you know in today's world we have a lot of misinformation out there about the military and, and uh, you know I'm, I'm trying to broadcast this put it out there for everyone so that they can hear these types of stories we may never see another draft again so hopefully not but it's interesting to talk to you dad and like i said before it's uh so proud to be your son, and I, I've always looked up to you. I guess we'll just summarize with everything and just say thank you very much, and uh, maybe maybe we'll have you on again just to talk about something else. Okay, that sounds like a deal. Everyone, thank you for tuning in today. And the next podcast we're going to have, uh, I might do another interview. I'm not really sure yet, but uh, we'll, we'll push out these three here, and then uh, I'll announce what the other one's going to be. All right, so everyone have a great week. Stay safe, and we're out.
You've been listening to the Morning Formation Podcast. We hope you found today's material helpful and of value to your current situation. Whether today's show took you back to a nostalgic time or helped you think about tomorrow, thank you for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you again. Make sure to find us on Instagram at the underscore morning underscore formation underscore podcast on YouTube at the morning formation podcast and send us an email at the formation podcaster at gmail.com. Stay safe and stay motivated. Warriors fall out.